The following episode is brought to you by the American Urological Association. Good evening, and welcome to AUA's Prostate Cancer Update 2024 Expert Guidance for Urologists live virtual course. We strive to offer outstanding educational courses and greatly appreciate your evaluations and general feedback so that we can continuously improve our programs. The AUA is accredited by the ACCME and designates this other activity for a maximum of 1.5 AMA PRA Category 1 credits. All persons in a position to control the content of a CME activity are required to disclose to the AUA as the ACCME accredited provider all financial relationships with any ineligible company, formerly commercial interests, during the previous 24 months. An ineligible company is defined as one whose primary business is producing, marketing, selling, reselling, or distributing healthcare products used by or on patients. The AUA must determine if the individual's relationships are relevant to the educational content and mitigate any conflicts of interest prior to the commencement of the educational activity. The intent of this disclosure is not to prevent individuals with relevant financial relationships from participating, but rather to provide learners with information so that they can make their own judgments. Coding advice given during presentations are the opinion of the presenters and may not have been vetted through the AUA for accuracy. Please verify accuracy prior to reporting on medical claims. You are prohibited from using or uploading content you access through this activity into external applications, bots, software, or websites, including those using artificial intelligence technologies and infrastructure, including deep learning, machine learning, and large language models and generative AI. The AUA would like to thank Astellas, Lanthius Medical Imaging, Novartis Pharmaceuticals Corporation, and Pfizer Inc. for providing independent educational grants in support of this webinar. Finally, I'd like to introduce and extend a special thank you to our course director, Dr. Minaj Siddiqui, for his time, talent, and expertise in developing this program. Dr. Mohammed Minaj Siddiqui is a urologist and professor of surgery at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. He completed his fellowship in urologic oncology at the NIH National Cancer Institute and residency in the Harvard, Massachusetts General Hospital Urology Program. He completed his MD in the Harvard MIT Health Sciences and Technology Program at Harvard Medical School. He currently holds administrative roles of Chief of Urology for the Maryland VA Healthcare System, as well as Director of Urologic Oncology and Robotic Surgery at the University of Maryland, which he joined in 2014. I will now turn the course over to Dr. Siddiqui. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, it's my pleasure to be here and join you all tonight. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. So. The activity goal for today, based on a document in need from the AUA Advanced Prostate Cancer Global Needs Assessment, the AUA is providing additional education to update APPs on the latest advance in the management of hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, including treatment intensification. Uh, it's also to update uh, urologists, which I think is today's uh, uh, goal, actually. Uh, the learning objectives. At the conclusion of this activity, the learner will align their practice with current AUA guidelines and recent amendments pertaining to screening, diagnosis, management of prostate cancer. Our goal is to also determine appropriate use of biomarker testing as it relates to the diagnosis and therapy. We want to talk about analyzing the role of imaging and types of imaging that aid in staging patients with prostate cancer. For implementing appropriate treatment paradigms for metastatic prostate cancer, including treatment intensification. And lastly, we want to discuss the, role, discuss the role of genetic and molecular profiling in the personalization of prostate cancer treatment plans. So we have a spectacular panel here today that really will help us cover this broad range of topics. It's my pleasure to now introduce our three subject matter um, experts here. 
I'll begin with Dr. Maria Baker. Dr. Baker is a genetic counselor and a professor of medicine at Penn State. She received her master's degrees in genetic counseling from the University of Pittsburgh um, Graduate School of Public Health in 1985 and her PhD doctorate degree in genetics from Penn State University College of Medicine in 1991. She is a diplomat of both the American Board of Medical Genetics and the American Board of Genetic Counseling with dual certification as master's trained genetic counselor and a PhD medical geneticist. Dr. Kelly Stratton is a urologist and associate professor of urologic oncology at the University of Oklahoma Stevenson Cancer Center. Prior to joining OU's Department of Urology in 2014, he completed his fellowship in, the, in uh, urologic oncology at the Department of Surgery in Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City, and his residency at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Department of Urology. Completed his MD with special distinction at the University of Oklahoma College Medicine 2007. We're particularly grateful to Dr. Uh, Stratton, who, who pinch, is pinch hitting today uh, after one of our previous panelists uh, was sick this morning. And so thank you for joining us today, such short notice. Dr. Uh, Tian Zhang. Dr. Zhang is a, a medical oncologist and an associate professor in the uh, Department of Internal Medicine at UT Southwestern Medical Center and a member of the Division of Hematology and Oncology there. She's an associate director of clinical research at the Simmons Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Zhang earned her medical degree from the Harvard MIT Health Science and Technology program at Harvard Medical School. So I have special love for the HST program also. And she joined the UT Southwestern faculty in 2021. Thank you all three of you for joining us. Wonderful. So we're gonna we're gonna kick this off. We're gonna go ahead and just jump right into our topics. Let's get started by discussing how we're going to structure the next hour as we have a lot to cover today. Um, and it's easy to get lost without some structure. So our goal is to discuss what is the most current and best practice with regards to biomarkers, imaging, treatment, paradigms, uh, and genetic and molecular testing across the spectrum of prostate cancer, um, at, at least in the hormone-sensitive uh, portion of it want to highlight some of the most strong evidence AUA guidelines along the way. So this is a tall order, but there's some structure we can use to help us cover this substantial ground. Um, we will run through these topics by phases of a patient kind of stage and journey, if you will. So we will start off with the screening and diagnosis um, segment, lo then localized prostate cancer, and then advanced hormone sensitive prostate cancer. We'll, you know, please, uh, for the audience, go ahead and if you have questions, clarifications and whatnot that you'd like us to kind of delve into as a group, go ahead and send those in. And we will be answering those by segment. So we won't be saving them till the end of the day. We'll instead, you know, we'll answer all the screening and diagnosis ones, then move on to the next section and and, and vice versa. Uh, to keep things somewhat manageable, we will exclude from tonight's discussion castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And we'll only touch on topics related to radiation therapy in somewhat limited ways. Now, regarding the AUA guidelines that we will cover, it's worth reminding everyone that there are five sets of prostate cancer guidelines published on auanet.org. Okay, these five sets are the early detection guidelines published in 2023, the localized guidelines published in 2022, salvage therapy guidelines published this year, 2024, advanced prostate cancer guidelines published in 2020 with amendments last year, 2023, and then also a hyperfractionate radiation therapy guideline, which was published in 2018. <clears throat> in all, these guidelines contain 167 statements associated with best practices in the care of the spectrum of prostate cancer. Each statement is given a evidence strength, okay? Level A, B, C, expert opinion, and clinical principle. And so level A is the highest certainty and there are certain criteria that give get, lead to a level A level of strength, okay? And so today, we're not gonna cover all 167. We will cover the 16 statements that are level A statements of, of evidence, and we'll, we'll explicitly highlight those for all of you as a reminder of just kind of what is published uh, in terms of high evidence quality care guidelines. So to start off, I'm gonna actually start off by, by um, asking Dr. Stratton a question. So, Dr. Stratton, what are your current day practices with regards to prostate cancer screening and diagnosis? 
And what are your thoughts, in particular, with the use of MRI, fusion biopsy, and biopsy approach with the transrectal and transperineal approaches? Well, thank you for that question. Um, there's a lot to dig in here, and I think it's it's extremely important, and we see this as uh, the effects of what happened in COVID when prostate cancer screening really stopped for a short period of time. Um, you know, this is a very important thing to mention to men. It's part of shared decision making. So it's important for urologists to feel comfortable discussing the potential benefits of prostate cancer screening with their patients. And even more importantly than that, it's important for urologists and the urologic community to talk with primary care physicians about the potential benefits of prostate cancer screening, because in many instances, they're in the trenches doing this screening. But the, the, the cornerstone of prostate cancer uh, screening uh, remains the PSA test, and that's where the AEO guidelines focus us to use PSA as a screening test and to offer PSA screening to men who are between the ages of, uh, of 50 and 69. And there are select group of men who may benefit from screening early, such as those with African-American ancestry, those who have a family history of prostate cancer, or those who are known to harbor a genetic mutation that may, may put them at risk for prostate cancer. So earlier screening is something to consider in those men. And in fact, uh, getting a PSA baseline test is something that the AUA guidelines suggest may be beneficial to those uh, earlier as well, between the ages of 40 and 50 as well. So PSA testing is very important. And um, the frequency of testing can be uh, altered based off the patient's preferences and the risk for prostate cancer. So, for instance, in that 50 to 69-year-old, uh, if they have a reassuring PSA, the frequency could be every two to four years, and it can be more frequent if necessary. In my practice, uh, many patients, we not only screen them for prostate cancer with PSA, but we're also managing other men's health items. and so. We see them annually, and in many instances, the patients are happy to get their PSA once a year. And so certainly that would be acceptable from a from the AUA guidelines, but it can be also spread out based off of their risks. Um, another, another thing that you mentioned would be imaging. And certainly this has become very important as we try to improve screening. We've always known that PSA screening may identify men who have indolent or uh, in, insignificant cancer. And so MRI can help us identify men who may be more likely to have clinically significant prostate cancer. And in fact, the AUA guidelines suggest that clinicians can use an MRI prior to an initial biopsy to increase the detection of clinically significant prostate cancer. Specifically, the guidelines mention that radiologists should use PIRADS as a scoring system to identify these clinically significant lesions and that patients should have a biopsy focused on that uh, in men who are biopsy naive. And these biopsies, which we refer to as uh, fusion or targeted biopsies, should be directed at the suspicious lesion. But men can also, or, or uh, urologists can also provide a systematic biopsy in that instance. Uh, for those men who don't have a suspicious lesion on MRI, but may still be at risk for clinically significant prostate cancer, the AUA guidelines suggest continuing with a systematic biopsy to ensure that those patients are evaluated. Um, there's also an option to use urine or serum tumor markers uh, to further risk stratify and determine men who may under one, who may want to undergo biopsy. So. In my practice, I, I primarily rely upon MRI as an image-guided method uh, to uh, identify men who would benefit from a prostate biopsy and to guide that biopsy. Um, importantly, our methodology of biopsy has been changing recently, and the tide is shifting from a transrectal ultrasound-guided uh, biopsy to a transperineal biopsy. And that's based off of uh, the concern that biopsies may lead to a risk of infection and other side effects. And so 
We have uh, studies like the Pro PC study and the Prevent study that have looked at uh, men undergoing biopsy and comparing transrectal biopsy to transperineal biopsy. In, in those instances, they showed a very similar cancer detection rate. So I think that that opens the window to transperineal biopsy. Uh, fortunately, they also showed a very low risk of infection even in transrectal uh, transrectal biopsy. So I think urologists who are interested in transitioning to transperineal biopsy should know that their cancer detection rate should be similar to uh, the transrectal biopsy, uh, but that there may be a lower risk of infection. And for those uh, urologists who are still using transrectal ultrasound biopsies, um, know that in many instances, their risk of infection still remains sufficiently low that they can uh, continue that approach as well. <clears throat> Wonderful. That's great. You know, and, you know, and um, uh, while we're talking about some of the, the studies, I, I think it's worth um, uh, mentioning. So there's, there's actually right before this whole thing started two hours ago. So this is truly fresh off the presses. Um, New England Journal, they just published the, the Gutberg 2 trial, which is a uh, screening trial that's been going on for a really long time now, 15 years, I think. And uh, they, that trial has actually transitioned to a uh, randomization for screening practices of MRI versus um, MRI target biopsy only versus MRI plus 12 core uh, to look at the outcomes of, um, of uh, detection of clinically significant and clinically insignificant prostate cancer. And so they found a 57% uh, a reduction, a massive reduction in um, detection of clinically insignificant prostate cancer if you remove the 12 core um, without a clinically significant decrease in detection of clinically of with, with, without a significant detection uh, decrease in detection of clinically significant disease so i think i mean this is still going to be a hot topic of discussion and and i think i think we all have to kind of spend a little time analyzing and understanding these results but it's 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 an area that i think we're still all trying to understand and evolve with yeah, and certainly there is concern uh, for the cost of, of using MRI before biopsy. That's something that is is asked in the chat box. Um, MRI before every biopsy um, could help in identifying men with clinically significant prostate cancer. Certainly, if we're using MRI to prevent biopsies in the future, uh, that may lead to cost benefits in addition to avoiding the detection of insignificant cancer. So I, I feel like it's, it's hard to say that we're going to initially reduce cost, but in the long term, we may reduce the cost by avoiding unnecessary biopsies, avoiding the detection of clinically insignificant prostate cancer, and maybe even avoiding systematic biopsies as well. And so you know, I think MRI may be helpful and the cost of MRI may be coming down in the future as well. Yeah. As far as um, using DRE uh, as a, a initial screening exam for prostate cancer, the AUA guidelines provide uh, an option for the use of DRE. The DRE as a screening alone for prostate cancer is not recommended. PSA is the foundation for prostate cancer screening. Um, there are many reasons that a primary care physician may want to do a DRE uh, in addition to prostate cancer screening. And there are many reasons that a urologist may want to uh, do a DRE. So I think DRE can complement PSA screening. It's rare in my practice that I would do a prostate biopsy based solely on a DRE finding. Uh, so I think it's complementary. Uh, it's something to consider. It's something to discuss with patients, uh, but the AA guidelines gives flexibility in that in that arena. And then, in regards to additional testing like 4K or uh, the uh, uh, MPS 2.0 score, um, these are tests that I feel like can be very helpful for urologists who are uh, working with the patient to determine the potential benefit of prostate cancer. Uh, uh, biopsy of a prostate biopsy. And uh, in that instance, 
most patients uh, appreciate the additional information. They um, they are interested in seeking uh, uh, you know multiple perspectives on the potential benefit, and so you can use those tests. Uh, you can also use PSA density, and you can incorporate the MRI and pyrid score. There, there are many different uh, avenues to trying to. Uh, work with a patient who may be at risk for prostate cancer and may be concerned about undergoing a biopsy. Wonderful, thank you. I mean, this this has been great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna transition a little bit into, but staying on this topic of risk stratification. So you know, I'm gonna bring in Dr. Baker now. So you know, Dr. Baker, we occasionally get patients with family history of prostate cancer who want to understand their their risk, not necessarily from these testing modalities, but actually from a more underlying genetic risk perspective. Uh, and so, you know, uh, thank you again for joining us, because I think you you have a lot that you can add with this perspective. Could you perhaps lay some of the foundation for the group of what is an optimal way a urologist should navigate these types of requests and just this working up a patient in this type of space? What information should they gather? What options should they offer patients? What are resources available to patients and clinicians alike to navigate the question of genetic predisposition, uh, excuse me, pre genetic predisposition to prostate cancer? particularly if the patient does carry some um, uh, risk factors. Certainly, and thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. Um, so in the clinic setting, uh, the family history is key. Uh, taking a thorough three-generation family tree, of course, you likely would not be drawing that family tree out like the genetic providers do, but at least eliciting the family history out to the third degree relatives. So that's asking questions about, you know, siblings, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, even going back to great uncles and aunts, which many people admittedly don't know those relatives. But the approach that you can take is one in the clinic setting, which personally I don't feel is ideal. Um, you have very limited time in the clinic setting. And so um, the alternative approach of you have a new patient, mailing them a new patient information packet that includes a family history survey, or as we do within the Penn State Cancer Genetics Program, we actually may, uh, send an electronic survey that patients uh, complete prior to the appointment. And before they even come to the appointment, we've already got a family tree drawn so that we can delve into evaluating that history and educating the patient whether it raises concern for a genetic predisposition where genetic testing may be appropriate. Um, in addition, for example, on our Penn State Cancer Institute website, we have an electronic survey that is available for anyone in our community and beyond if they want to know whether or not they're at increased risk, where they would be a candidate for genetic counseling and testing. And our program brochures have a QR code that they can scan to take the survey. So we've tried to implement a number of ways where um, maybe less traditional ways where it's not taking up the time of the provider during the clinic because they have very limited time available. You know, once you have that information, then the challenge becomes are, is recognizing whether or not there are warning signs or red flags where maybe that patient should be referred on for genetic counseling and testing. And that's where we mainly refer to the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Guidelines or NCCN. And these guidelines are updated multiple times each year. In fact, just two weeks ago, uh, they updated the testing guidelines for prostate cancer. Um, in some respects, it can be uh, somewhat easy to implement those guidelines. For example, any male with uh, metastatic, high-risk, very high-risk prostate cancer is an automatic candidate for genetic counseling and testing. If they have low-risk prostate cancer, though, then you need to add in some family history information or whether or not they have Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry to determine if they're a candidate. And that's where it can get a little bit complicated. It's almost, you know, might be better to take that one page from the NCCN guidelines, laminate it, and have it in every clinic room so that the provider can quickly determine do they meet guidelines or not for a referral. Um, 
And so, you know, if the patient is a candidate for um, genetic counseling and testing, then you need to decide, you know, what constraints do you have within your clinic setting? Do you want to refer that patient via the traditional approach to a genetic counselor or a genetic counseling assistant who may be in your institution? Um, they may be available in your local community, if not in your own private practice setting, or we even have telehealth genetic counseling available now. So if you don't have those resources immediately available to you, um, all you would need to do is Google find a genetic counselor. Um, the URL is www.findageneticcounselor.org and you can specify that you want a cancer genetic counselor as opposed to a prenatal or a neurogenetic counselor and then indicate what state you live in, what your zip code is, and uh, it will populate with genetics providers in your area, either for in-person counseling or by telehealth. Um, so that's the traditional approach. Alternatively, um, you could implement uh, having uh, a genetic counseling assistant within your own clinic setting or training one of your staff members, maybe a nurse practitioner, a PA, um, to coordinate the genetic testing in collaboration with some genetics providers that they can reach out to if they have questions. Um, some centers have actually even developed a genetic testing station, which is not specific to one clinic, but it's there within the institution. And, you know, gynoc can refer a patient, urology can refer a patient, gastroenterology, and they just go to uh, the genetic testing station, and typically they'll have a genetic counseling assistant or a genetic counselor uh, in that station to implement um, testing that very day while the patient is there. Um, so I think with that, I'll um, turn it back and uh, see if there are any questions that come in um, that we need to discuss further. Perfect. Great. Thank you. You know, and I love. I love the website, findageneticcounselor.com. I think whoever came up with that was very smart. .org. Uh, .org. <laughs> it's a, it's a yeah. great idea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep things moving to, uh, for timeliness um, and, um, and transitioning, actually, to kind of the topic of localized prostate cancer. So we're beyond screening. Now we're on diagnosed prostate cancer. Um, can you run through how you risk stratify and line up treatment options for patients starting, you know, for, for treatment uh, for patients diagnosed with prostate cancer, kind of starting with the low risk side and working your way up uh, along that spectrum for localized disease? Sure. I think, I think men um, are, are increasingly becoming comfortable with Gleason grade group. And so I, I really like to start there. You have their PSA usually from before the biopsy a clinical stage that you may get from a DRE and then a uh, great group and even tumor volume within the biopsy can all be used to help risk stratify patients. For those who are low risk, uh, you know, the guidelines recommend active surveillance as the preferred management option. And I think, um, you know, we have been greatly aided by the debate about whether to even cause uh, call grade group one cancer or not cancer. And so, you know, introducing that debate into the discussion, I think it really helps frame the risk of low, low risk Gleason gray group one prostate cancer. For those who have favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer, we can discuss active surveillance or radiation or even surgery. Uh, some men will also ask about ablative treatments like cryotherapy or HIFU. Uh, and, you know, I think that those are all things that are a spectrum of treatment. Uh, and then for higher risk disease, we really kind of focus in on radiation therapy and, and surgery are our primary treatment options. So um, for men who have low risk prostate cancer, we're um, thinking about active surveillance. So in that instance, imaging with an MRI 
uh, and their PSA trajectory, understanding that I think helps us helps them uh, uh, anticipate the future as far as when their next imaging would be, if they are going to undergo a confirmatory biopsy and so forth. There are gene expression assays like the Cypher or Prolaris that may be helpful. Typically, I use those in the intermediate risk patients, uh, and in many instances, patients undergoing radiation therapy, the radiation oncologist may be interested in knowing their, for instance, decipher score to help determine whether they would be uh, receiving androgen deprivation therapy or not. So um, the, the guidelines suggest that men who are on active surveillance should undergo an MRI to aid in risk stratification, and I think that that's very helpful for them and also for men who may be undergoing radiation or surgery for intermediate risk prostate cancer. So that, that's kind of how I frame it. And then uh, work with patients to identify a treatment that may align best with their preferences and uh, uh, concerns about quality of life and the impact of treatment. That's great. Um... I think, you know, and uh, of these topics that you discussed, actually, one one that w was, uh, you know, also mentioned in kind of the question. So what do you do when when the MRI prior to, like, someone's going to get surgery and, and the MRI shows um, this kind of, like, abutment or or bulging, you know, of of the tumor against the, the prostate edge? And, you That's know, a great question. For possible um, ECE, yeah, I mean, I think um, early in the MRI era, there was a, a great deal of concern to a degree that uh, surgeons would even avoid nerve sparing based off of abutment or engagement of the capsule. Uh, the sensitivity is only about 50%. So it's kind of a, a coin toss on exactly how extensive the disease will be. And so I think um, as we have grown to understand the benefits of MRI and its limitations, we've uh, developed some uh, confidence in, in applying our surgical skills to uh, still do a nerve spare if everything looks uh, acceptable in the operation. Um, it's something that we can talk with patients about and make sure that they're aware and then proceed with surgery in a way that uh, we hope to have a negative margin because I think that that's very helpful down the road. So, um, you know, I, I, MRI is very good at identifying a lesion. It's, it has limitations in as far as identifying extra capsular extension. Yeah, I, I I couldn't agree more. I think I think this really speaks to as as these as this imaging is becoming more ubiquitous in our field, and especially in prostate cancer, for urologists to to really look at the images, because you, when you see the images, you you know and and learn to identify the lesions, you know, with the guidance of the radiologist saying there's a lesion there, it helps, right? But but then find that lesion and see see how it really should impact your management plan, your surgical planning and whatnot. Certainly, it's all um, a collective picture uh, in the same way that many of these tests um, are not necessarily uh, predictive of the future. They're more um, prognostic. And so we have to be mindful of that. Yeah, you knocked out two of the questions already. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go to Dr. Baker now. So, Dr. Baker, you have thoughts on genetic testing and active surveillance, as well as in patients with more um, uh, high-risk disease, all in the kind of in this localized prostate cancer space. Yeah, here again, family history is key when you're uh, working with uh, a patient who has, you know, a low-grade uh, prostate cancer. So, um, you know, referring to those NCCN guidelines. Um, you know, we do know that there are a handful of two of genes that are known to predispose to prostate cancer. Some of them are more likely, notably BRCA2, for example, to predispose to a more aggressive type of prostate cancer. And uh, it's important to know this information because NCCN is now incorporating a change in management recommendations, uh, recommending prostate cancer screening starting at 40 and annually thereafter 
for males who have either a BRCA2 mutation or uh, if there's a TP53 mutation for leaf Romini syndrome. Otherwise, they're a little bit more uh, soft in the recommendations for the other prostate cancer susceptibility genes they are recommending that they consider. So there's a subtle difference there where they recommend for some and they recommend consideration for others. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, again, I, family history is key here, uh, especially with the low risk prostate cancer, because they're not going to qualify in their own right, unless they have Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, or unless there's some family history that's going to raise it to a level. Um, of course, I will contradict myself there. I think coming down the pike is uh, universal genetic testing for every patient with a solid tumor diagnosis because you know, we have a study out of Mayo called the Intercept Study where they looked at patients with eight different types of solid tumors, including prostate cancer, and roughly 13% uh, of those patients had uh, an underlying germline predisposition. Uh, so we're seeing this with ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, um, where we are starting to test all patients. Breast cancer, based on American Society of uh, Breast Surgeon Guidelines since 2019, we've been offering testing to every patient with breast cancer, uh, genetic testing. So I think it's just a matter of time and with the cost of testing continuing to decrease in price. Uh, the, the challenge is going to be how do you uh, enable all those patients who would then qualify to access genetic testing? What providers are you going to use? What alternative service delivery models? I work in a uh, green building, so I need to move around a little bit more. <laughs> so Wonderful. You know, and while we're on this, I mean, it's fascinating this this idea that 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 testing essentially everyone with cancer could become a standard practice. Uh, well, one of the questions that's asked in the chat, and I, I, I'm sure many have kind of run across, is what um what considerations for for uh, um you know, uh, some of these other aspects of life, insurance coverage and 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 privacy and all these types of things should should urologists be aware of as as they're recommending patients to get testing? Yeah, a uh, very good question, because that historically had been a barrier for patients pursuing genetic testing. Uh, when I started the cancer genetics program in 1998, just a couple years after the BRCA1 gene and two genes were discovered, and just a little bit after the Lynch genes were discovered, there were many patients that were very ambivalent about pursuing genetic testing for two reasons. One was the cost of the testing at the time, and we were not as successful in getting testing covered back then. Um, and two was the concern about genetic discrimination, whether genetic information could work against them or their family members in some way. And fortunately, in the years that have passed, there have been a number of federal laws enacted that protect us against genetic discrimination. And this is part of our genetic counseling session, a traditional counseling appointment prior to the patient undergoing genetic testing where we mention uh, the fact that we have HIPAA, we have the Affordable Care Act, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act, which protect health insurance and employment. But unfortunately, it is important to point out, we don't have any federal laws that protect life insurance, long-term care and disability insurance. So we do discuss that with the patient. Um, we mentioned that they can get all the no questions asked Life insurance is part of their benefits package at work, since that's based on employment, not health history. It's only if they would want higher levels of coverage where they may need to fill out an application. And sometimes when patients learn about that, um, they might put a pause on the genetic testing and they'll speak with their children, they'll speak with their husband um, or vice versa, their partner and um, think that through. Do they want to purchase private life insurance before undergoing genetic testing? Um, so it's a valid concern. 
Um, and we're not typically in an urgent situation unless surgery is pending that we have to do the genetic testing right there. We want patients to feel comfortable and at their pace if they're going to move forward. Wonderful. I'm going to now move up to um, move move into more of the aggressive cancers um, and and bring in Dr. Zhang. Um, so we, we're now entering territory that overlaps with your practice, particularly in the high risk patient population. What type of further workup do you like to see in patients um, who plan to go, say, like undergo have high risk prostate cancer, radiation and ADT is their plan? Um, uh, and you know, when, with, especially with regards to the, the the systemic therapy, the ADT portion, what kind of durations? Do you have thoughts on like what type of durations and 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 the use of the, some of the more traditional luprolite type agents versus newer agents um, uh, such as the agonists and the oral agents as well? Sure, I'm happy to talk about um, you know some of the workup that we see. Um, I know we we don't advocate for conventional imaging um, for unfavorable intermediate risk Gleason seven um, localized disease, um, but uh, we do uh, want to see these um, CT bone scan um, types of workups for high risk uh, Gleason eight to ten prostate cancer. Um, and since the approval of uh, the PSMA PETs, um, we've seen a really a um, big uptick of PSMA PET imaging for staging and high-risk localized disease. Um, and those PET scans are often picking up on um, PSMA AVID lesions um, that uh, pose a new earlier metastatic category um, than we had previously dealt with. So I'm sure many of my medical oncology colleagues are partnering with um, urology co colleagues out there um, in order to um, help those patients um, kind of navigate um, this PSMA positive um, um, earlier metastatic uh, disease. Um, in terms of um, hormone um, deprivation and ADT um, duration, um, my practice is, is quite in line with the AUA guidelines. Um, so with uh, Gleason 7, unfavorable intermediate risk uh, prostate cancer, I give about six months of ADT. And, um, and then in high risk localized prostate cancer, um, I would opt for at least 18 months um, and generally try to shoot for two years as long as the patients are tolerating well. Um, and this is concurrent um, and uh, in, in uh, conjunction with um, people's uh, radiation therapy. Um, and a few trials um, have studied this more formally. Um, there was a, uh, a DART 0105 trial a few years back. 50% um, of those patients had high risk prostate cancer. Um, and in that uh, cohort, uh, they were uh, looking at 20, um, uh, 18 months of ADT with external beam radiation therapy compared to four months ADT, um, showing improvement of, of metastasis-free survival versus, and also overall survival. Um, and then there was another trial called RADAR, um, where about two-thirds of those patients had high-risk prostate cancer. And again, 18 months of ADT compared to six months of ADT um, improved uh, distant uh, progression-free survival. Um, and in terms of the biomarkers, um, we've seen some interesting biomarkers um, recently uh, where our Terra AI and also um, uh, Decipher scores um, can be helpful for us in, in terms of considering who should be getting a short course of ADT uh, compared to no ADT for intermediate risk disease. Um, in, in terms of all the treatment options that are now available for ADT, um, there's all, um, a, a number of different GNRH agonists um, and then also two GNRH antagonists available. Um, the newer antagonist, um, Degorelix, is um, a subcutaneous monthly formulation. Um, and then the oral Relagolix, um, which I think um, has had a lot of uptake recently, um, is given orally and has a very short half-life. Um, and uh, the registrational trial for Relagolix, um, HERO, um, was a phase three, uh, comparing Relagolix to Lupron for a year, um, showed really similar testosterone suppression um, with about a third of the cardiovascular events and also faster testosterone recovery. Um, so I would choose those um, uh, patients who will have shorter courses of ADT and um, also those with significant cardiovascular comorbidities um, to think about Relagolix for them. That's great. Um, I mean, it's 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 been a rapidly evolving space, and 
you know, a lot to keep up with. I, while while we're on this kind of topic of just you know how how this space is changing, how about how about any thoughts on the combination therapies that are out there, and do, do they have a role with the localized uh, prostate cancer population? Uh, sure. Um, so there were about two stampede cohorts. I, I really um, commend the British um, for for doing the uh, the stampede trials. Um, but two of those cohorts had patients with high risk localized disease um, uh, and treated them uh, with abiraterone, prednisone, um, and then um, one of the cohorts also added enzalutamide. Um, so the the short answer is that. Um, if, if patients have two of the risk factors, which are T3, T4 disease, Gleason 8 to 10, or PSA over 40, um, if you add abiraterone and prednisone um, to ADT, um, they will have improved metastasis-free survival as well as overall survival. Um, and so um, it is part of my practice um, to consider um, those patients with high-risk prostate cancer um, and think about adding abiraterone for those patients. Um, in, in terms of the PSMA PET positive, I, we have this um, fascination now that, that this population is really burgeoning in our clinics. Um, the PSMA po PET positive um, population, um, you know, and, and should we intensify treatment for them? Um, it is it's really a data-free zone at this moment, um, and multiple studies are underway. Um, but uh, we, we sort of took a retrospective look at our UT Southwestern um, cohorts uh, with PSMA pet positive disease, um, but CT negative disease, um, found that those patients have pretty great outcomes, um, very low rates of progression to castration resistance, um, and also very low uh, rates to um, uh, de developing metastatic disease. Um, so I, I'm sure much more to come in terms of intensifying versus not for that patient population, um, but certainly something that um, is on the radar to to be on the lookout for. Yeah, that's great. We're going to be talking a lot more, I think, about PSMA as as we kind of continue down this progression of disease. But I think I think uh, I would agree with you that you know the 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 utility of PSMA continues to to become more and more evident. And I think that there's a lot of areas where it's very helpful. That's great. Um, I'm gonna transition us now to the next segment, which is post-treatment failure patients now. Well, um, so now transitioning to this post-treatment failure, we're gonna focus on, on patients who've had say like radiation and now have a, a recurrence. Um, so maybe we'll go back to Dr. Stratton for this one. How do you, how do you monitor and work up a possible uh, biochemical recurrence after after initial treatment? Sure. So, you know, after surgery and radiation, we rely heavily upon PSA to help guide us in uh, identifying patients who have recurrence. For those patients who are undergoing radical prostatectomy, we don't typically use adjuvant radiation therapy. So we're really looking for men who have a rise in their PSA and uh, or persistence in their PSA after prostatectomy. For, uh, for those with radiation, we're looking for a nadir, but we're being cautious not to react to a bounce. And so that's the real art of medicine there. Um, in those who have, for instance, risk factors for recurrence, we may be more vigilant, like uh, a man who has uh, high risk prostate cancer who underwent prostatectomy or had positive margins. Um, for those who are at risk for recurrence and have a rising PSA, we would want to uh, be sure that we don't miss metastatic disease. So uh, in those instances, we could use a PSMA PET and, uh, and evaluate for sites of recurrence based off of that. Uh, for those who have uh, radiation therapy, um, if we're looking for a local recurrence, so these would be men who don't have any evidence of metastatic disease, I feel that it's important to biopsy them to confirm local recurrence, and that can help identify men who may be candidates for salvage therapy. So I think the combination of PSA uh, imaging, including PSMA PET, and then biopsy if there's a concern for local recurrence. That's great. I mean, this we, we've come so far, I'd say this, and this is just in, in, in the brief period that I, I feel like I've been practicing that, you know, last five, seven years, these these the maturity of these imaging modalities availability of, of and and kind of approval of some of these imaging modalities the um, ability to do target biopsy has really changed how we manage patients in this space um 
and it allows for kind of more precise determination of recurrence, uh, which I think, you know, we used to do just adjuvant. Adjuvant was like standard and now it's now it's not. And it, that, that itself is a remarkable, I think, uh, uh, advancement. Yeah, I, I think that it's in line much more with the preservation of quality of life. We're really looking for treatments that may impact patients' longevity and understanding that uh, we have a very high bar in men who have had prostate cancer treatment and may have uh, a detectable PSA, but um, may not be at risk uh, for metastatic disease. So um, as far as recurrence after radiation therapy, some men will be able to undergo additional local therapy, and that's very important as well. Uh, because in patients who have failed all local therapy, we now have new options. So in those who are candidates for local therapy, the biopsy can help guide that. And then they could consider things like uh, cryotherapy, uh, uh, other ablative treatments like HIFU, re-radiation, or salvage prostatectomy. So there, there's a, a new uh, window of opportunity for salvage in men who've had radiation therapy, and I think it's important to discuss that with patients. Yeah, that's that, that and that that's that's great too. That the, there are more options, and I think that these options can also be catered to the nature of the recurrence and the anatomy and the location of the recurrence. And in, in many situations, you know, it's nice having extra tools to to treat these patients. Sure, and and in those who have now failed all local therapy. Two trials have uh, provided us with evidence to support combined androgen deprivation therapy. So I'm, I'm not sure if we're going to talk about this later, but the Embark study and, uh, and an additional study have shown that, for instance, the addition of enzalutamide or apalutamide may help these men uh, and reduce their risk of metastasis or PSA progression-free survival. Well, that, that's, a, that's a perfect cue to bring in Dr. Jang here. So what are your thoughts, Dr. Jang, on, on, on the use of ADT in these patients? Yeah, um, you know, I often will, will consider the rate of um, uh, at which point they're recurring, right, uh, with biochemical recurrence. Um, so time to recurrence is important. And then also their initial Gleason grading. Um, and, you know, if they had Gleason 7 disease um, with relatively short time to recurrence, I would, I would still give um, 6 to 12 months of ADT. Um, if it's been a you know many years since their um, prostatectomy and now um, their you know late recurring um, disease, um, I, sometimes we will skip the um, the ADT and and go straight to radiation. Um, with a higher risk of Gleason eight to ten initially, um, and uh, usually these folks are uh, recurring uh, relatively earlier. Um, uh, we would still prefer to give. Um, 24 months of ADT and um, the radicals HD trial um, uh, was one in this post-op population that compared uh, two years versus six months. And, and then that high-risk patient population um, found two years uh, to improve um, that time to disease progression. Um, so certainly adding ADT for that high-risk population, especially those who recur earlier rather than later. That's great, Dr. Chong. Thank you. Um... Do you use any of these biomarkers in this in this setting? Yeah, it's, it, it, I think that's still an evolving picture. Um, we have some um, trials now that are looking um, and using decipher scores, um, but um, so far, um, you know, uh, nothing really has um, has shown us um, these patients. You know, the high risk decipher are the absolutely the ones who um, have to have intensification or not. Um, so um, I, I do implement them as part of trials that are ongoing, um, but uh, you know, more, I think much more to come as the um, NRG trials uh, read out in the salvage setting. That's great. Thank you. Um, I think we, we do have a little time to, to, to take some of the questions, and I think, I think one that... Um, uh, has been commented in the text, but um, uh, I'll, I'll have the group also discuss is, um, um, uh, so, so after a um, radiation recur recurrence, should, should biopsy of seminal vesicles 
uh, be be standard. And Dr. Stratton, what what what's your practice in that space? A lot of these men who I'm seeing in clinic are interested in salvage cryotherapy, and uh, in that instance it's difficult to freeze uh, the seminal vesicles kind of impossible just anatomically. And so uh, if they have disease in the seminal vesicle, they would be at risk for recurrence. And uh, so in, in that instance, I oftentimes will attempt to biopsy the seminal vesicle to assure ourselves that we don't have an early failure after salvage cryotherapy. Now, if men are planning to undergo uh, salvage prostatectomy or radi radiation, then uh, you may be able to get away without a biopsy of the seminal vesicle. But um, in, 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 in every so often, you'll see a, a man who has a positive biopsy. And in that case, I, I don't offer them cryotherapy. So it's meaningful to me. You know, and um, are, so I, I've, I've more or less moved away from salvage prostatectomies. Are, are, are you still doing uh, some in it or who would you, I mean, there are, I, I've done, I did one last year in a really young yeah. patient. Uh, and I'd love to get your thoughts too. Like, uh, are you still doing them and who would you offer it to? Uh, well, salvage prostatectomy has a very high risk of incontinence. And so I think it's in men who understand that and are willing to balance the risk of recurrence and the potential for cure with the risk of uh, incontinence. And I do think in some younger men, they may be more resistant to incontinence uh, or they may be more willing to treat incontinence later and understand that a prostatectomy may afford them the option of cure and avoidance of androgen deprivation therapy. When I'm talking with men who've had radiation therapy, who are seeking salvage treatments, my frame of reference is often uh, in light of, kin of androgen deprivation therapy. So if, uh, if, a, if a gentleman is particularly interested in avoiding androgen deprivation therapy, then I want to generate a treatment strategy that may keep them from needing uh, androgen deprivation therapy in the near future. Wonderful. Okay, well, I'm going to transition us to the final segment of this evening, which is advanced prostate cancer. And so, Dr. Zhang, um, I'm going to come back to you here to, to lead us off on this topic. Can you take us through how you risk stratify a patient presenting with de novo metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer? Yeah, sure. Um, and this um, space has really um, uh, uh, expanded in the last 10 years or so as um, uh, we first had results of the charted trial um, in 2015, showing the benefit of docetaxel in this space. Um, and so really the high volume, low volume criteria um, come from um, the charted trial and, uh, and thinking about um, uh, you know, more than four bone mets, um, the, the presence of uh, non-axial skeletal mets, um, and then any visceral mets um, having high volume disease. Um, in my practice, I also um, think a lot about discordance with um, lower PSAs um, with um, concurrent metastatic disease. Um, uh, I think of those as being a bit more anaplastic, less um, AR-dependent disease. Um, and then uh, just um, two weeks ago at the European Society of Medical Oncology meeting, um, there was a, a really interesting and compelling study of using the Decipher score um, to predict for uh, docetaxel response um, based on the Stampede trial. Um, and it was um, really interesting to me because they could use a high-risk decipher on the localized archival tissue to then predict for patients with metastatic disease who would benefit from docetaxel. Um, and I think that it really sh it gives some ob ob objective criteria to this um, sort of anaplastic state of the, the low PSA, but um, uh, having metastatic burden um, that the decipher um, uh, genes that are tested um, uh, could potentially pick up on things like P10 or P53, um, uh, CMIG perhaps, um, that all um, kind of come into this category of higher risk um, prostate cancer or anaplastic disease that um, responds more to chemotherapy. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and you and you 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 mentioned kind of how 
how everything's changed with especially some key trials such as a charted trial. I mean, it's amazing how impactful a, a handful of trials has been in this space and how we have a field have gone from Lupron, you know, Luprolite for everyone, uh, maybe with some biclutamide, which, you know, if, 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 if the urologists and just anyone on this, on this, uh, uh, this this webcast podcast whatever you want to call it like it takes one thing away it, it is the wrong answer now to give a metastatic uh, prostate cancer patient monotherapy you know luprolite and so uh, what what is the correct <laughs> what is the, the nuanced correct I, I I know there's not one correct answer but what is the nuanced correct answer from your perspective Dr Zhang uh, on on how to how to treat these patients. Yeah, as you mentioned, there's been a, a number of trials, right, um, uh, to support uh, docetaxel use with charted, abiraterone with latitude, um, and enzalutamide. There were two trials, Enzimet and Arches, um, and then apalutamide with Titan. Um, and then, again, also two weeks ago um, at the European Society for Medical Oncology meeting, there was a, a trial, phase three trial called ERA-NOTE um, presented for metastatic hormone sensitive disease that was ADT versus ADT with darolutamide. Um, and, and so, you know, my take home um, really is that none of these have been compared head to head to each other, right? Um, we can't say any in particular for AR targeted therapies are any better than, um, than the others. Um, but um, when I'm seeing a patient in clinic, I'm often talking about side effect profiles and, um, and also um, the access issue, right? So um, uh, the, the financial um, picture of co-pays for a lot of these um, uh, specialized medications are, are quite high. Um, abiraterone of all of them um, is the only one that's um, become generic um, and easier to access. Um, and so I'm, I'm putting all of those in context as I'm seeing a new patient um, with uh, metastatic hormone sensitive disease. Um, and and to, to harken back to the earlier portion of this um, discussion, anybody also in that um, first uh, diagnosis of metastatic disease, we're also talking about um, uh, germline genetic testing too. So a lot to pack in in that first visit. Um, but uh, there's certainly um, a number of doublets um, that are, are available, approved, um, and I hope um, everybody takes away from this uh, session that we should be adding uh, and intensifying treatments for metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. Yeah, that's a great message. I'm going to pull in Dr. Stratton here. So, you know, I, I, I mean, we, it, this space has gotten complicated, but these drugs are still very well tolerated and and urologists have been giving ADT kind of in in parallel and collaboration with our medical oncology colleagues for for a very long time now and um, and so you know it, it, there's variable practice on how much urologists are either feel comfortable or are set up to to give these more kind of involved treatments but it is certainly think something that is done in many urology practices I know Dr. Stratton that you, you you do some of this in your own practice. Do you have advice on on to the urologists if if they're if they're interested in kind of treating these types of patients with with these with with these various combination of drugs on what kind of infrastructure and um, uh, process they need in their clinics to to manage these patients? Absolutely, you you know a, a multidisciplinary approach has been found in many instances to be beneficial to patients. And uh, urologists who are interested can have a varying degree of involvement as a part of that multidisciplinary team. Uh, it really does take uh, a, a multitude of people to help advanced prostate cancer patients get the best possible care. A urologist, a medical oncologist, a radiation oncologist, a geneticist, uh, nurse navigators, physical therapists, nutritionists. There are so many different avenues with which uh, we can uh, collectively help patients. Certainly from a urologist's perspective, as we move these treatments earlier into the spectrum 
of care, uh, they're, they are being introduced to urologists, whether we want them to be or not. And so I think there is an opportunity for urologists to increasingly become involved. Just as I look through guidelines as far as uh, use of, for instance, abiraterone, there are many instances now that abiraterone is an option for men with out metastatic disease. So for instance, those undergoing radiation with high risk disease or those with a PSA recurrence who are receiving radiation, there's some uh, potential option for that as well. Um, and so, you know, I think as a urologist, we see that the window is opening for advanced anti-androgen treatments and, and other treatments as well. Uh, at the same time, we are increasingly respectful of our colleagues who provide very elaborate care uh, beyond the care that we provide. So, um, for instance, genetically targeted treatments, ARP inhibitors, uh, many urologists are not necessarily doing that, or infusional chemotherapy for patients. And from our radiation colleagues, things like uh, targeted PSMA targeted radiotherapies as well. So, you know, we all are are growing more and more involved in the in the care of advanced prostate cancer patients. And I think having a multidisciplinary team, whether it be led by a urologist, a medical oncologist, or another member of the team, is most beneficial for patients. I think I think that's a great message. I think I think maintaining that multidisciplinary, you know, collaborative spirit and and you know doing what you can as a urologist but also knowing when to bring in our colleagues and so speaking of which you commented on on kind of uh, precision medicine personalized care and and coming back to dr baker here what are your thoughts on genetic testing for for this metastatic prostate cancer population um, and uh, what you know, what what additional benefit or meaningful insights can we get by referring patients for germline testing in this population? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm not an oncologist. However, um, it's very beneficial for this patient population with metastatic prostate cancer uh, to be offered genetic counseling and testing. It has not only treatment implications, um, you know, the example of a BRCA2 germline mutation, um, making that individual a potential candidate for a PARP inhibitor. And it's not just in prostate cancer, it's for metastatic breast cancer, for ovarian cancer, for pancreatic cancer. So these other individuals with different tumor types um, also you know, have a number of uh, targeted therapy options they might be, um, uh, that might be appropriate for them. And it really has caused, I think, a paradigm shift where, you know, when I first started um, providing cancer genetic counseling services, everybody looked at this as optional. Like, do I want to do genetic counseling or not? Do I want to do testing or not? But now, because the genetic information is impacting their oncologist's ability to decide best treatment options, um, it's become more relevant and less, even though it's technically still optional, it just becomes more relevant. Um, and of course, the family history, you know, children, I see as a primary motivator for individuals, and I have to remind the patient Yes, but this has benefits for you as well. It's not just your children. It's not just your siblings, your cousins. Um, it's going to benefit you personally to have additional information for your oncologist to help decide the, you know, the treatment plan. Um, you know, and I'm not sure if we have time, but uh, I did want to touch upon either now or a little bit towards the end, if there is time about the challenge of how do you even choose a lab for genetic testing? Because there's so many of those labs out there. How can you discern which ones are qualified laboratories versus not? And so, you know, just quickly, um, you need to only utilize the CAP accredited CLIA certified labs. Um, you need to be aware of what their billing policies are. Do they notify patients in advance if they're going to have a large out-of-pocket expense? How do they handle patients who have Medicare or Medicaid? Do they balance bill those patients or that can they reassure the patient that they will not have an out-of-pocket charge 
regardless of what the insurance does or does not pay. What are their patient assistance programs? Uh, some of these programs are very generous based on, you know, federal poverty uh, guidelines and uh, number of people in the household. Um, and self-pay prices, which for some people have brought it down in a range where even if they don't meet strictly the criteria that are currently established. We know NCCN guidelines, they're great, but they're just, as I say to my patients, people in white coats drawing a line in a sand. And they're going to miss a number of individuals that have a hereditary predisposition. So we never turn away a patient. Uh, if they want genetic testing, we may tell them we, we can't justify billing it to insurance, but then we'll turn them towards one of the self-pay options that can be as low as $250 out of pocket for 80 or so genes, if that's what they want. Um, we talk about, um, you know, when we decide between different laboratories, what's the reclassification policy for these variants of uncertain significance? Because we don't always get black or white answers with genetic testing. Um, you know, some of these genetic slabs will proactively reclassify the VUSs by culling the literature on a regular basis, whereas other genetic slabs, I've just personally had this experience with a patient I saw back in early 2000, um, who unfortunately had since passed away from colorectal cancer. She had a concerning VUS at the time, a concerning family history, and the lab never reached out to say that the VUS had been upgraded to a mutation. We just happened to be data mining our, um, our database and looked that particular variant up and found that there were other labs that had reclassified the variant some years ago. And so I contacted the original lab and it turns out that they, when we didn't have as many choice of labs, they only reactively reclassify variants. So it requires another patient to submit a sample with the same exact variant before they will delve into the literature again. And lastly, some of these laboratories have policies regarding um, free reflex testing. Let's say the patient only feels comfortable doing a smaller panel, but then once the results become available while they were waiting for those results, results they learned about another relative that had some other type of cancer that wasn't covered with the panel that they pursued. For 90 days, 150 days, depending on the laboratory, you have the option to reflex on that test at no additional charge. And some of the labs even offer free testing for the biological relatives once a mutation is found. So there's a lot that goes into trying to decide what's the best laboratory for the patient in front of you. Very helpful. Thank you. And, you know, I think that there's there's a lot of details here that are invaluable. And uh, um, so so then, you know, I, to, to close out this evening, um, uh, I'm going to actually pop it back to Dr. Zhang. And so, you know, I think that say a patient has gone through all of this with Dr. Baker and, and comes to you now with, with this profile, say, you know, let's say we, we had that question in the beginning, uh, you know, they have a BRCA2 mutation, for example, or any a number of other types of mutations. Um, what, what do you do with this? How do you, do you, do you, you know, how do you, how do you integrate this into your practice? Sure. Um, for homologous recombination or repair defects, you know, I like to find those out earlier um, rather than later so that um, when those patients are, are candidates for um, either single agent PARP inhibitors or uh, for the now we have three combinations approved for castration resistant prostate cancer, um, you know, we can actually start talking about those and offer those combinations to our patients. Um, often those are patients deciding between oral treatments versus chemotherapy in the CRPC space. Um, and um, they're often choosing the oral combinations. Um, uh, and it's great to have that information um, in, in hand. Um, to Dr. Baker's earlier point of VUS is being reclassified as more pathogenic, you know, I do think there's some value um, for those of us who have access to molecular tumor boards and kind of thinking through molecular alterations um, within our institutions. 
um, you know, it's it's really helpful to think about that. Um, and then there are some of these um, BRCA2 reversion uh, mutations that actually restore um, function for BRCA2 um, protein. And so um, it's always um, a wealth of information when we can sort of share expertise across the institution and, and think through these um, mechanisms of, uh, of these mutations as they come up. And every once in a while, I, I tell my patients um, that have these, um, we, we find um, a microcyolite unstable um, alteration or a tumor mutation high, um, a tumor mutational burden high uh, tumor. Um, and these patients often will respond to immune checkpoint inhibitors, even though um, we don't have any currently approved for prostate cancer, uh, but we used um, the tumor agnostic um, label uh, for pembrolizumab in those settings. And I mean, we've seen some um, remarkable um, treatment outcomes um, with pembrolizumab for those uh, particular alterations. Um, so in general, I'm a big advocate um, for uh, finding these gene uh, genetic mutations early and um, offering uh, treatment options when they come up. Um, there's also a couple of trials that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, Amplitude and Talapro3 are both for um, HRR alterations in the metastatic hormone-sensitive space. And then um, also a Capitello trial using Capaversertib um, for patients with P10 loss or um, PI3 kinase alterations. Um, so those three trials will be some to, um, that will read out likely in the next um, few years in the um, hormone-sensitive prostate cancer setting, and, um, and I think we'll have more targeted therapies to offer there. Very cool. I mean, I think, you know, if you take a step back and really think about what, what's being done now and what you're talking about, I mean, this is, this is kind of the future. When I was a fellow, I feel like this was what was being discussed as like the future of medicine, you know, like the TCGA project was like a big deal and, you know, sequencing and using, you know, giving, giving, giving people personalized medicine based on their, gen, you know, genomic and somatic sequencing and whatnot. And that, that's uh, the fact that it's actually being done and tested and trialed is, is really, you know, pretty remarkable. I think we take it for granted sometimes how far we've come. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it speaks to the fact that all, not all prostate cancer is the same, right? Um, there are very aggressive types, and we've all seen them in our clinics. And, you know, if we can drive down to the bucket of why their tumors are more aggressive and trying to um, shut down that pathway. Um, so um, to your point, um, we'd love to um, separate out these disease biology as best we can and, and target them um, if, if we have the uh, ability. Um, I think there's still a lot more um, buckets, if you will, of prostate cancer that we don't understand how to target and um, still still much more to learn about them. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's going to creep down. I think uh, even the localized disease, you know, I, I, you know, we talk about integrating imaging and genomics and all that. And I, I think it's going to be, you know, interesting few years ahead of us. Um, I am going to wrap up this evening because I think we're we're pretty much running up against time. I think we could probably keep going for another hour if we were given the time. But uh, so so um, I will transition to the um, uh, conclusion phase of this. So this concludes our panel. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it, it was a, a pleasure to, to have you all. Thank you for your engaging and your comments and your questions. And, um, uh, and have a good night. <laughs>